Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Rethinking Legal Ops. This is where we have forward-thinking conversations about how the integration of law and tech are changing the way we practice and perceive and interact with law. Uh, my name is Ashwada Saxena. I'm the co-founder and head of legal at Speed Legal. And today we have an amazing guest with us, Jenna Sansahero. She is on the advisory board of um, uh, as an advisor at Xmentium. She has worked at Netflix at the, as the head of strategic knowledge management. She's a legal strategist, very, very experienced with legal ops and legal strategy and, and tech. So I'm so excited to have you here, Jenna. Thanks so much for having me. Very excited to be here. Yeah, and I remember just our conversation, you know, uh, it's now been uh, a couple of months, almost, I think, more than a month. And I just really resonated with all your energy and, you know, your excitement for innovation and just figuring out innovative things of doing legal better. Uh, so I'm so excited to get some of your insights and just to kick things off. Um, I want to ask you, um, what has your, uh, what has been your journey like so far, your professional journey? Uh, what what drives you and, and what are you, uh, what have you been doing uh, during this time with Netflix and now at Expentium? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I would say, I mean, I think as with many people, uh, I came to this place in a roundabout way, right? I don't think there is any particular direct linear path uh, to get here. But uh, my background is I started um, as an entertainment lawyer uh, back after law school in the mid 90s <laughs> and um, practiced business and legal affairs in the entertainment space for a couple of decades, uh, ran a couple of film companies along the way, uh, did a variety of things. And eventually I moved over into operations, actual like corporate operations, uh, which I found um, like a natural extension of a lot of the business things that I had been doing to that point. Um, but I've always been kind of a big picture person. So um, that fit really well. And so when this opportunity came up at Netflix, uh, it was a brand new role uh, that seemed to me married very nicely my business and legal affairs background with the operations experience that I had. And um, the concept of legal operations wasn't actually something that was on my radar, even, you know, this was back in 2019. And clearly legal ops has been around for a lot longer than that. But um, I was not brought in in a legal ops role. I had a, a wonderful colleague who I'm, you've probably heard of. Many folks watching or listening um, will know Jen McCarran. Um, so of course, I was very excited for the opportunity to work with her. And really, she's the face of legal ops and tech at Netflix still to this day. Um, but I saw it more as an opportunity to come in as the legal practitioner, right? And um, more from the client perspective to help kind of bridge that gap to be someone who was coming in, which I, I don't think a lot of companies have the luxury of having someone who really embraces the idea of innovation, is excited about what legal ops can do for those teams, but also really speaks the language of the team that they're serving. Um, in this case, the broader sort of content, business and legal affairs folks. Um, so anyway, I, I had the opportunity to do a lot of really cool stuff there with, uh, with Jen and with obviously the many hundreds of other colleagues that we worked with there. Um, and so I have this great interest in tech and ultimately left Netflix to now join Xmentium um, on their advisory board because I'm excited about the tech that they are working on. Um, but I still, to this day, don't consider myself really, you know, a legal tech person. I, I love legal tech and I embrace the folks that are doing amazing things in legal tech space. Um, but still as like a, a purveyor of the benefits of what legal tech can do, right? Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And wow, what a what a what a great journey uh, and such such rich experience just working in all these different companies. And you must have, um, you know, I, um, I I kind of um, I want I want to find the right word, but I really admire the uh, just the amount of experience you would have gotten in sort of just this hands on management of knowledge management in all of these different companies and what really helped them scale and what were uh, what were all the all the problems. I'd, I'd love to hear. 
uh, more more about that um, as well. So I'll just kick things off and ask my first question. And um, what do you think, Jenna, are, is, are, are the factors that help in-house legal teams scale? And what is the role of legal tech in that? Yeah, I think, um, again, having a sort of a strategic big picture vision is certainly important to helping companies scale, right? You know, it's, you can have a map, but if you don't know what point you're trying to get to, it's hard to design a path to that. Um, so I think that's really important. And I think, uh, you know, at least in my experience, and of course, this is a very, you know, transactional based, I think legal tech means different things, obviously, to different types of, of people, legal professionals. Um, but in my case, coming from a, a very transactional um, space, uh, it's what we discovered and particularly with the kinds of complex business dealings where like a Netflix or, or any other entertainment company, the negotiations can be quite complicated. There are many, many, many different deal types. It's not just, you know, one type of deal or two or three. Um, and every deal is a snowflake. So what we found, at least what I discovered is that doing things manually is just simply not scalable or it's super cost prohibitive, right? You can never throw enough people at the problem or it would cost outrageous amounts of money to hire as many people as you would need to really stay on top of it. So from my perspective, you know, you have to embrace tech at some point. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to, to do that. Um, so I think tech plays a, a huge role um, in addition to just the, the amount of work that you would have to throw people at, um, you know, every person, every layer that you add is additional opportunities for mistakes. Um, you're getting one further step away from that central source of truth. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, siloing that can happen when it's, humans involved because each individual may have their way of that they like to do things and and having come from this culture of um freedom and responsibility that netflix very much embraces you know the the beauty of that is it allows practitioners to do things in the way that is best for them but you still need to have a cohesive sort of universal plan you know and be on the same page and and so I think tech is really important in helping to connect those dots. Yeah, yeah, totally. And what areas of legal legal operations or just you know knowledge management when it comes to legal uh, do you think is legal tech most effective at optimizing? Um, I think that you know, look, I think the low hanging fruit that we often see, and this is for a reason, is that high volume, repeatable, sort of simpler. Um, lower level tasks that, that are happening a lot over and over and over again. I think that's why we often hear about, you know, NDAs being a great uh, place to start because it's like a relatively simple thing. It happens all the time, all day, every day. And like, it's not rocket science. You don't need to have, you know, a super senior person negotiating every single NDA. So, so those are the obvious ones. Um, and there are many and every business has their own that they would obviously be best positioned to identify. But what really interests me, and which is why I, I really have enjoyed the last few years of the work that I've been doing, is the longer term, like really kind of revolutionary um, changes that will that, that are really scalable, but they take more time. You know, they're, they're very strategic. Um, and because change management is difficult, which I know we're going to probably talk about, um, it's hard to, you know, you really have to have the backing and the support of all the people, clients, you know, the, the people at the company that you're serving um, to go along on the ride with you. Uh, because those changes, I mean, we can see the vision for some of those changes. I know you and I have talked about that before too, um, but it takes, you know, it takes some time and it takes some faith, I think, in the people yeah. doing it. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, very well said. Take some time and take some faith. I think, but for like uh, the success of any type of type of tech tool, I think those those words are uh, so so uh, so true. And um, particularly for legal tech, because um, I was just talking with um, you know an, an, an attorney, and you know we were just talking about like how important the client relationship. Um, is you know when it comes to legal tech tools like really working with uh, a client or like a company or the responsible people you know, for implementing that tech is to the success of that tool because um, sometimes as entrepreneurs as founders when we're developing these tools uh, we know sort of all the details of how that tool tool works right but uh, sometimes when you're implementing that solution it may not be as well calibrated to the needs of every particular client like you have to take that sort of like a custom approach um, you really have to work with people to show them that you know we're, we're accountable we take responsibility for this tool that we want to help you I, I think that is that is just extremely extremely important like that people element so that really very much resonated with me, um, which brings me to you know, the question of uh, what are some of the key strategic considerations that uh, go into play when um, planning or creating your legal tech toolkit for a company? So um, drawing off of something that you just said, because I've been having these conversations lately too with folks, I think part of it is 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 really framing the conversation um, because ultimately legal tech and frankly, the legal professionals that are implementing the tech are serving the business, right? They're serving yeah. the business needs. The legal tech is intended for use by the legal professionals, but it's ultimately benefiting the business. And I think that's the part of it that's difficult to convey appropriately and I think needs to be conveyed in different ways, depending on you know what the tech is. Um, but ultimately, that's also, I think, a conversation between the business side, you know, at a, at a company like a Netflix, you know, the client really is the, the business and the creative executives, right? And, and then the legal professionals, but we all as legal professionals have different forms of clients where, where this is all true. So part of getting the support for implementing legal tech is, I think, also conveying that message to the business of why this is going to help move the business forward because what the business wants is of course um you know speed <laughs> efficiency they want to move deals faster um there has to be an element of you know discovering your risk tolerance um in order to do that because of course you know i can move deals very very quickly if you're super risk tolerant and sometimes you need to be a little bit more careful right so those are all considerations but um so strategic. Uh, so in crafting a legal tech toolkit, I would say, you know, obviously budget is is an issue. Um, also, as I mentioned, risk tolerance. And then I think it's about thinking through what are your short term goals and your long term goals. So, um, you know, the answer may be different for the shorter term. I think you have to balance, at least again, in my experience, I think you really have to balance uh, short-term wins with longer-term gains because, um, you know, a lot of this is psychological, right? So is, is, if you can continue to show those short-term wins and those shorter-term benefits, you'll continue to get the support that allow you to proceed with those maybe longer-term, more strategic goals that you're, that you're trying to serve. So um, mm -hmm. I would definitely, you know, strongly encourage folks to be thinking about that as they're implementing tech, um, because you know you can't. Um, there aren't, I think, enough voices in the room yet uh, yeah. in this area to allow for just a one giant long-term plan. Like there have to be yeah. those short-term wins along the way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and going off of you know a, a very important point that you made about you know how like legal tech tools are meant to be used by legal professionals to make their lives easier, but um, the the benefits really go to to business because in house legal teams are no longer just like you know the cost center like the legal that's separate. It's a strategic business partner, and so for any sort of buy that sort of um, communication of the benefits has to be to business as well. So when you are talking about, you know, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, a legal tech tool vendor, um, who should be like, what should their strategy be? Like, who should they approach? Like, who would be the person that would be the most effective in sort of 
helping move those sort of uh, transactions along. Like, you know, I have a solution. I know you have a problem. You're a big company. I just don't know who to sell to. Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, um, if I had the perfect answer, I'm sure we could probably all make a lot of money from that. But <laughs> um, but no, I mean, you know, I hate to be so so lawyerly about it, but really it depends, right? Like the answer is it depends on the company. Um, it depends on the tech, you know, um, something, you know, I've seen where absolutely the best way in is through a legal ops professional, if there is one or, or more than one at the particular company. Um, but I've also seen types of tech where it's not necessarily evident to um, maybe a legal ops professional who doesn't also have deep experience in the actual business. Um, it may be more obvious to a business person how something can, you know, keep things from getting hung up or, or provide data that would be really useful in their future dealings or whatever, you know, whatever benefit that you're looking to, to solve, to, you know, provide and um, the problem you're looking to solve. And so I think the, the best way to answer that is, you know, to come at it with a lot of curiosity, you know, talk to as many people in the industries you're trying to serve and, and just figure that out. Let them tell you, you know, part of the job, I think that was most important, certainly in my last role was like, just knowing the questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And, and I think there's still this pretty big divide between legal professionals and tech uh professionals um in the way they communicate in the way they approach problems um so finding someone who can bridge those gaps or or finding a way to talk to those folks that you're serving and and just figure out the right questions to ask and then i think that will guide people to the to the right answers yeah yeah no absolutely very very well said just knowing the right questions to ask and sort of taking a more tailored approach by company because some of these structures can really differ in each company and uh, um it um and i think for like legal tech tools in, in particular because there could be applicability for the legal professional there could be applicability for the non-legal professional and uh, we see that all the time with xp legal because we're, we've got two use cases like one for lawyers you know in-house teams and then one for like non-lawyers like um you know someone in like the finance team sales team or just the legal ops team in general and sometimes it can become like hard like who do we go to because they you know, everyone's life can sort of become a little bit uh, easier. So it's so important to, you know, have the right, the right questions to ask. We're just learning, um, learning as we go. Um, and and uh, in your perspective, Jenna, uh, what do you think is more important? Do you think it's like just the overall quality of the solution or the ease of implementation? Like if you had a tool that was just fantastic, that could solve all your problems, but was very complex and like implementing took a bunch of money and time and took a lot of training for your staff to, you know, pick up the tech uh, or a slightly less strong tool, which was very like easy to implement. Just like, you know, it's like a plugin or like, you know, it's just like a software that you just download and it kind of works like Microsoft or something like that. Uh, what would you think is, is more beneficial for companies? I would have to give the edge on that to the tool that's the easiest to implement. Um, mostly because even though I'm a fan of, you know, the sort of bigger, more complicated, probably solutions, the reality is the best tech in the world is potentially worthless if nobody's using it. Right. So, um, I remember in talking to colleagues um, about a particular tech that I was very excited about, you know, the, the first question that came to mind from the, you know, decision maker in that particular instance was, who's using it? Will anybody use it? You know, yeah. like, come back to me and tell me about it when you've got people actually using it. So all of that to say, anecdotally, I, I think, um, I think it's important that, that it's ease of implementation, good UI, you know, et cetera. But I will say, I also think that if there is a way, and I think this is something that I'm, I'm hoping uh, it will, people will see that Xmentium does quite well, 
um, if there's a way to have a tool that offers robust and, and really complex and layered um, features, but can be built upon where there's like an ease of entry, where you can get that buy-in, where you can get people comfortable with an interface, where you can build the trust uh, in the brand or the, or the tool or whatever, the team, and then organically layer on top of that, here are all the other features you're not even using yet that you can benefit from. Like that's to me a really good way um, to get beyond just sort of like that low hanging fruit we talked about earlier. Great. And, and where does a good user interface, um, you know, fit into all of this? How, what is the relevance or importance of a good, a good UI? I mean, I think basically what we were just talking about, um, and noting that that's really subjective. So to some degree, right. I think there are some people, you could look at certain things and just say like, okay, objectively, yeah, that's beautiful. This is a great UI. Um, and then other things it's like, I'm sure for every lawyer or legal professional you've ever known, they all have a preference of like, they keep their desktop screen or what their dash looks like, or, you know, so, um, you, like, you probably wouldn't want to try to get too in the weeds on like, assuming that you can please everybody, because as we know, you cannot. Um, but I do think that a nice, clean, very, um, intuitive UI can certainly help in that implementation piece and, and the comfort level of people who might be a little bit um, uh, resistant to embracing new, new things. Great. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally agree with that. And, um, you know, it's so it's so important to, you know, sort of constantly keep collecting that sort of feedback from from people. Uh, because again, you know, when you're sort of on the back end to say building, 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 you know, everything can seem simple to you because you've been working on that project for a year or two years, right? So you know it. But for someone that just comes in and looks at it, it's like, what is this? I, I don't know uh, anything. So it's so important, like going back to your point of like, you don't know what you don't know. So so important to collect that feedback, uh, to have the right questions to ask, to have advisors who will kind of tell you about what are some of the right questions to ask in the first place, you know? So just like, yeah, and I will and I will say because uh, you brought up such a good point about you know you've been in the weeds on it and you know this tool so well and um, I, I have found um, in on a number of occasions um, when presenting or demoing something for someone for the first time you know I've been guilty of this I've seen many other people be guilty of this where you kind of dive into the things you think they want to see the meat of it you want to show you're excited to show the features. And, and then like you forget to say, oh, by the way, this thing you're looking at here is an outline of that thing you're seeing over like the really basic stuff that kind of feels like, oh, you know, I don't want to talk yeah. to you like you're dumb, <laughs> but, um, but these people are seeing it for the first time. And so even though you may be demoing it for the hundredth time, it is important to kind of cover those really simple, basic, high level things uh, and set the stage because you can't assume people know what they're looking at and it's easy to get confused. And then the eyes glaze over and they don't know what they're looking at and they're lost and you kind of, yeah. you know, you've lost an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, abs absolutely. And just having like a very nice sort of like deck to explain things, you know, that's like clean and like doesn't have too much, too much information because it's, uh, it's hard to sort of put a year or two years worth of work in, you know, in just like 10 minutes, you know, so you just give them like the most relevant parts that like, you know, that you don't decide what's the most relevant, you have like some idea, but then you practice with colleagues with like advisors, and then you know, you kind of figure out like, what are the parts you should even be like, talking about and really doing that research about your audience, like what are things that your audience might be most interested in, you cannot you know, go to um, a group of lawyers and just start talking about, you know, how like they will no longer need to read legal text, right? Because they're like, that's kind of what I do. You know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I find if you're, you know, the beauty of if you're super well versed in the tech um, and you and you're able to, you know, if you have the luxury of being able to do, for example, live demos, you know, it's great to have decks. It's great to have, you know, short videos and things like that. Um, 
but it's really wonderful to be able to do live demos because you can come in with an outline and then let the, the potential client tell you what they're interested in. Because in my experience, they'll see something and they'll say, wait, can you show me that again? Or can we dig in on that? And you may end up spending way more time in an area that's like one small piece, but that was the thing they were interested in. So um, yeah. it's, it's good when you know it well enough that you can pivot like that and hopefully yeah. answer more questions. Absolutely. I think the best way to explain what you're doing is to just show people, you know, very quickly, like, yeah. okay, this is like my software, do X, Y, Z, but then you actually show it to them, like, like, this is it. And then they can sort of zoom in, as you're saying, it, they, you know, you can let your sort of audience guide you through, like, you know, what you, uh, what they want to want to hear. And if you know your stuff well, then you could just pivot. That's a, it's a very, very good point. I will, I will make a note of that. It's a very good idea. Um, uh, and um, just, you know, as a final question, um, Jenna, what are some legal tech trends that you are personally most excited about? Um, you know, I think the things that really I'm excited about that I'm hearing people talking about, well, some of the things that I'm seeing more of, including the things, some of the things I'm working with are the modular things like what I talked about earlier, um, but particularly like, and I'm seeing it from other places too, in different ways, um, being able to break things down, for example, contracts down to clause level, you know, and build from there. The kinds of things that I'm excited about and that people are, I think, more recently talking about are the ones that are leading the dots, because the one thing that we are going to have ahead of us, I think, is a challenge, is, and as we've seen for a while now, anyway, is this idea of tool fatigue, right? So it's great if you have all of these amazing tech tools that solve a piece of a problem. Um, but if they don't talk to each other, if they can't connect, or if you're expecting legal practitioners to learn 10 new tools that have completely different interfaces, that, you know, have completely different purposes, it's, it's, it's just not realistic. So the more that people, and on the other hand, there's the, you know, if you try to solve for everything, maybe you're not doing that one thing as well as you could. So of course it's a balance, but I do like the idea of some of these companies that I know are, are looking from a, a bigger picture perspective to connect the dots. So even if they are focused on solving the thing they're trying to solve for, um, they're also thinking about how do my clients that I'm serving do business and what can I help connect to for them so that they're not now having to learn a whole other environment or so that they can pull in the thing that they're doing and, you know, in their document management space and using that, uh, you know, to create contract template drafts, you know, yeah. or whatever. So, um, so I'm excited about those, about those kinds of trends that I'm seeing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And and again, going just back to like knowledge management in itself, it's it's so, so important because so many companies will have a bunch of resources, but people don't really know like how to properly leverage them or like where to even find stuff. And uh, just in general, and like the overall like universe, there's just so much that one can benefit from, but without knowing where all the information is, without connecting those dots, that kind of value cannot be cannot be unlocked. So those, th those tech are definitely very, uh, very, very important and very useful. Um, and uh, with with Xmentium, what is your what is your hope, and what are your what are where you're hoping to uh, where are you hoping to take the company, and what are the things that what are what are the dreams with Xmentium basically? Well, I'm I'm hoping you know I, I'm feeling very uh, excited about you know the response that we're seeing is very very early stage showing the tools to people for the first time um, and and really learning about what is exciting to them and and um, what they're responding to and of course as with many things you know different companies are are seeing different benefits and what's what's fun for me is as we're showing um, people the tools, uh, they're actually seeing other uses for them that like I haven't even thought of yet. So that's super cool. Um, so I I'm just looking forward to people seeing this, this really amazing work that the team at Xmentium has, has done and how they're solving problems for like language collaboration and contract negotiation and moving deals faster. Mm -hmm. um, because you know it's it's a it's a pretty remarkable uh 
tool that they've that they've created and so i'm just i'm i'm really super super excited about seeing people start to use it amazing i'm excited to see where expentium goes as well and to learn more about you know like the technology and um i'm sure it would really grow and prosper under under your guidance and, and leadership and uh, i want to thank you for this conversation this has been very insightful and very informative i've learned so many things and um and i'm looking forward to you know having many more conversations with you uh, offline as well and um as in the and also thank you to all our uh, all our listeners for tuning in every week and for all your excitement for legal tech uh, do check out um, Xmentium and all the amazing work they're doing. Uh, check out Speed Legal. Uh, we're trying to really change the interaction between people, businesses, and legal documents. And uh, you know, it's kind of like the overarching theme for this podcast as well. Just you know, changing the way people you know look look at law and not as a cost center, but you know, as something that's fun and something that's you know uh, strategically important and can add a lot of uh, value to to businesses. So. So thank you, everyone, and thank you so much, Jenna, once again. Oh, thank you, and very well said. Thanks so much for having me. I'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Great.